Amongst that set lived one Francis Galton, a gentleman scientist who had investigated everything from meteorology to statistics. Shortly after his cousin, Charles Darwin, published his Origin of Species, Galton became fascinated with the idea that the survival of the fittest did not just take place between species, but within them, with an aim to explaining why the various peoples of the world occupy the positions that they do. Galton and his friends started a new field of inquiry called eugenics. Unsurprisingly, it concluded that the rich and powerful were rich and powerful because they were genetically superior, and it offered a simple solution for improving the lot of humanity. The most elitist interests of the moneyed class became universally accepted in the Western world within a generation. Country after country had implemented laws to allow the government to sterilize those citizens it deemed to be unfit. The true horrors of this strain of thought came to light when the German eugenicists, based at the Rockefeller-funded Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, gave the Nazi regime an ideological excuse to take the idea to its logical conclusion. Eugenics had to become crypto-eugenics. This was accomplished in a number of ways. The British Eugenic Society, for one, merely changed its name to the Galton Institute. The American Eugenic Society morphed into the Population Council, a group set up by John D. Rockefeller III, where members continued to advocate the very same policies for reducing the population of third world countries as they always had, only now they did so in the name of fighting overpopulation rather than fighting bad genes. Julian Huxley, brother of the famous writer, helped organize UNESCO in 1945. In the founding document of UNESCO entitled UNESCO, Its Philosophy and Its Purpose, he argues that one of the key aims of the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization would be the re-legitimization of eugenics so that the idea would once again become thinkable. He also went on to co-found the World Wildlife Fund with Nazi SS officer Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands. Within a generation, science was once again ready to tell us why the only way to save humanity was to stop people from breeding. This time, the public was whipped into a furor not about Jews and gypsies, but about carbon dioxide and environmental sustainability. The cover had changed, but the racist eugenicist text remained the same. In the logic of the eugenicists, the meaning of human life is itself transformed. Instead of something valuable, something precious, something to be desired and nurtured, fought for and celebrated, humanity is reimagined as a cancer, something inherently evil, the mere existence of which is a burden on the world. But the problems we face are also unprecedented. Global warming alone, says Paul Hawken, threatens to make all six billion of us homeless in the decades ahead. This, unsurprisingly, encapsulates the modern environmental movement's position almost perfectly. Human life is no longer something to be treasured, but something to be measured in carbon and then reduced. In the man-made global warming myth, humans are merely an obstacle to the proper functioning of nature. In the eugenicist fantasy, the earth is saved when people die. In both ideologies, if they really are separate, the ultimate genocide becomes thinkable.